Somewhat less dramatic was another Goodyear venture of the time, and though it had none of the majesty of the airship ticket program, it couldn't be beat as far as creativity was concerned. While airships were the most massive inflatable craft ever built, Goodyear's curious collection of inflatable rubber planes were small enough to fold into a large package. One of these, the GA-33, ranks among the most novel aircraft ever constructed. With its conventional shape, it was similar to any other light airplane, except that it was comprised almost entirely of rubberized material. The main fuselage was covered with nothing more than the material fabricated for Goodyear's airships. But the wings and tail needed to be much more rigid if it was to function like a normal plane. What researchers came up with was an entirely new material, a technology known as air mat. The rigidity of this futuristic material was amazing and proved itself more than adequate to keep a light one-man airplane aloft. As with all the normal control surfaces found on any other light plane, it did need some additional bracing to support its weaker surfaces. Nevertheless, it was a solid piece of engineering. Goodyear designed and built the inflatable plane in just over 12 weeks. They hoped to fill the military's need for a portable observation aircraft although other ideas were also in the works. Incredibly, the inflator plane didn't need a great amount of air pressure to fill it up. In fact, Goodyear claimed that the entire aircraft took in less air than the average car tire. The secret behind the success of the GA-33 was its air mat fabric. In it, Goodyear had perfected a material that bonded the two outer surfaces together with a weave of flexible nylon fabric. The nylon pre-stressed the load-bearing surfaces and reduced the material's flexibility, making it inflatable and solid. The air mat could become extraordinarily rigid, yet when the cells were deflated, it folded up just like any other rubber material. Goodyear foresaw numerous uses for their concoction, and as the years passed, they perfected various methods of forming air mat so that it could be shaped more finely to form pointed contours. The aerodynamic advantages of this finally enabled the inflatable airplane to get off the ground. In the fall of 1952, GA-33, the world's first powered inflatable plane, was ready for its first flight test. And with test pilot Dick Ulm in the open cockpit, the GA-33 rose into the air. After a few short laps, the inflatable plane made a perfect landing. The air was released, and it was returned to its compact, deflated form. Goodyear had described the GA-33 as a crude design simply built and meant to demonstrate the practicality of an inflatable aircraft. Ohm said that it behaved very similarly to any conventional light plane, but without any protection from the elements, it must have been a pretty bone-chilling experience. was an easy goal to obtain. After all, the deflated plane was just a mass of rubber and a very basic engine. But what Goodyear was really concerned with was the GA-33's overall performance. So, using newer, improved techniques to shape the air mat material, they went on to produce even more sophisticated versions. This is the GA-447. Its wings were much more aerodynamic. It also used a new lightweight air mat to improve performance. The flight control surfaces were also enhanced, both in their manufacture and operation. Then, some basic instruments were fitted into this skeletal plane. But from the pilot's point of view, the most significant addition was a flexible canopy that provided welcome protection from the freezing temperatures and blasting wind. Along with these advances came increased fuel capacity, and it was thought that this second-generation inflator plane would soon be flying much more than a demonstration run. Its mission requirements stipulated that the plane fly 200 miles at 60 knots. This improved version was heavier than earlier models, 
and several reconfigured landing gears were tried out. The first attempt was a lightweight tricycle arrangement. But this was later discarded in favor of a single unicycle wheel like the ones used on gliders. With this, the problem was solved. the Goodyear engineers thought that the GA447 was nearly ready. They began to investigate its potential uses. With its rubber construction and high-mounted engine, it was a natural as a boat plane. That meant taking off and landing on water. And almost immediately, company designers came up with the perfect hydroskid landing gear. remarkably well. With the engine so far above the plane, water and spray didn't interfere with its performance. And the overall buoyancy provided by the rubberized fuselage ensured the plane would never sink. Helping matters, the aircraft was so light that very little pressure was ever exerted on the hydroskid. But perhaps the best part was that in addition to water landings, it was just as operational from normal airstrip. protective silver coat. The second model in Plato plane made flying actually look easy, like something not too daunting for even the average person to try. In fact, test reports suggested that the more sophisticated in Plato planes were just as easy to fly as earlier versions. flight wasn't everything, and neither was the portability of the deflated unit, because if the plane was to be of any real military use, it would also have to be fully functional and easy to inflate. Therefore, the packaging design was almost as crucial as the aircraft itself. In combat, pilots might not have access to mechanics or any other kind of support, so everything that the aircraft needed to get aloft and to stay aloft had to be included in the kit. First, the pilot unfolded the wings so that the compressed air could be easily and quickly pumped in. Next, he removed everything from the plane's mobile storage pallet. It was also envisioned that these small rubber planes could rescue downed pilots even dropping by parachute from other aircraft in the course of their mission. The pilot stretched the fuselage out in the same way as he did the wings. It was a straightforward operation, and no time was wasted in smoothing out creases in the surface material. After this, he placed the engine about where he expected it to be in the aircraft's assembled form. Although a hand-operated device could be used to inflate the aircraft, a bottle of carbon dioxide was provided to speed up the process. After that, a pump on the engine took over the rest of the job. Once the plane was airborne, this pump constantly topped off the air pressure, keeping it steady throughout the flight. pilot had to do was sit back and watch the compressed gas do its work. It only took five or ten minutes before the folded mass of rubber became an operational aircraft. The pilot's next job 
job wasn't quite so bizarre. Like any flyer, he carried out his pre-flight safety check, making sure that all systems were good to go. The control surfaces were closely checked to make sure they were intact. Working alone, the pilot took a securing rope and fixed it to a stable point on the ground. This ensured that when the motor was started, the plane didn't run off without him. Everything secure, the 40 horsepower Nelson four-stroke engine was primed and the blade spun. When the prop kicked in, the whole assembly jerked forward. All that remained was a brief walk around the wing and on into the cockpit. After a quick check of the aircraft's simple controls, the throttle was adjusted. Almost ready, the engine compressor gave the plane one last shot of air. Then, the securing line was released. The engine revved up, and before you knew it, the rubber plane was airborne. Goodyear's second inflator plane, the GA-447, so intrigued Army and Navy officials that they placed orders for 10 additional models just to further explore the potential of this unique aircraft. had even greater dreams for their inflator plane. Not only did they envision a two-seater version, but also a vertical takeoff model that would actually lift a man out of dense jungle. And it didn't end there because even larger versions were proposed. Inflatable gliders that could rescue bomber crews stranded on ice or at sea. Drawings were even made up for a rocket-powered version. But as with many dreams, it just never came true. The two-seater, primarily considered a rescue vehicle, would be the last of the inflator plane experiments. The program went forward for several years, but in spite of the fact that there were only two accidents, neither the Army nor the Navy ever submitted production orders. Knowing that the profits from such a venture would be minimal at best, Goodyear dropped the project. We will return with Wings in a moment. On the Discovery Channel. Now we continue with Wings on the Discovery Channel. Goodyear's endeavors in the aviation world weren't limited to blimps and rubber planes. At a time when American and Soviet engineers were fresh out of the starting blocks in a race to put men into orbit, the company heavily committed itself to the exploration of outer space. Zero. Liftoff. One novel concept they developed was an inflatable vehicle that accurately foreshadowed today's space shuttle program. It filled to its preform size and shape in just a matter of seconds.
high-speed reaction of these inflatable preformed structures could be employed in many ways. The rigidity that Goodyear's AirMat provided encouraged the company to explore the material's potential as an emergency wing. The main advantage in a structure made from air matting was its simplicity. There were just no working parts that could go wrong. That is, so long as an adequate seal was used. Wing, fin, or elevator could appear in a matter of seconds, and the concept had seemingly limitless possibilities. All of these innovations spring from the simple hot air balloon, and even this has found uses in the modern age. It seems like something out of a Hollywood script, but the process of aerially retrieving personnel from the ground has actually been around for a long time. And extracting people from hostile territory simply couldn't happen without a helium balloon lifting the air hook well into the sky. Today, military blimps have passed from the 